The US Social Studies textbook often likes to refer to manifest destiny as the 1800s belief that the United States had the right to expand from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. But the fact of the matter is, is that the United States has always been expanding. It started off as colonies, winds up fighting for its independence, and then it winds up becoming states. And from there, it was just continuous movement westward. In the 1800s, during the Jefferson administration, we wind up purchasing the Louisiana Purchase from France. And once, as we get to the mid-1800s, we have a war with Mexico, and we wind up acquiring land from Mexico, such as Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and parts of California. Now, of course, with all of that expansion, right, we do see some negative effects of it. And we're going to see some negative effects of it as well as we move into the 1900s. Um, when we're looking at the negative effects of that expansion, the Native Americans were in North America long before Europeans sent explorers over. And once Europeans sent explorers over, there was that encounter with the Native Americans. They couldn't hold up to European diseases. So their population began to die. There was also conflicts that they wound up having with the Europeans. And then as the as the colonies wound up becoming states and the states become organized and they become a country, they have a functioning government, they also see that there's a lot of opportunity by moving out west. And when it comes to that opportunity that's moving out west, even though the Native Americans are going to be there, it's going to be their land rightfully as far as they were concerned, the Native Americans and was, as was seen by the United States government, were going to be people who were going to be in the way, and they needed to be moved out of the way, because this was going to be something that benefited the United States. When you look at this painting, this whole idea of American progress, here you have, you have this woman in the middle representing the United States. And of course, when we're looking at progress and, and a lot of benefits of moving out west, we see the railroads, which wind up uh, going across the continent, which is going to make shipping much easier, which is going to make transportation much easier, which is going to make people getting from the east coast of the United States to the west coast of the United States much easier. That's going to help with settling. And in terms of that settlement and the benefits of the trains, we see commerce, we see trade. Trains are going to make things much more faster and efficient, similar to how canals and the shipping industry made things much more faster and efficient. This winds up creating jobs. A lot of other industries are going to benefit from it as well. The lumber industry, the steel industries. So the United States, as it has, gotten, as it has expanded, has also gotten richer as a result of it. And even as we see this movement westwards, we see, unfortunately, Buffalo getting pushed out of the way. And that population is going to decline steadily. We also see Native Americans moving out of the way. So now that we have control of the Atlantic and the Pacific, one way of looking at the United States is that you can look at it as a business. You can look at it as a corporation. And when it comes to having control of the continent of the United States, well, there's always room for growth. Just like in every business or as an individual, there's always room for growth. And when we're looking for growth and if we're looking at the Pacific Ocean as a business opportunity, there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of room for growth in the Pacific. Because what we have in the Pacific is that we also have merchants there. We also have whalers in the Pacific. And what do these ships need to continue to move and function? They're going to need coal. And if you think of it as well as a long road trip, if you take a long road trip, you're going to have to stop. You're going to have to stop to use the bathroom. You're going to have to stop for fuel. You're going to have to stop for food. You're going to have to stop for water. So when we're looking at the Pacific and, and expanding throughout the world, one way to view the Pacific in terms of the United States government is you have to look at these as opportunities <clears throat> for refueling. But today we're going to talk about opening up trade with Japan. Now, if we're going to go out and make a presence, especially in the Pacific, and we're going to make a statement by being out in the Pacific, well, we need to send somebody who has that commanding authority. So when we look at who we're going to send, we're not going to send the Gilligan and the Skipper because when they took their little voyage, if you've ever seen a Nick at Night rerun of this show, it didn't really work out as evidence with the ship and calling for Mayday. And of course, they were stuck for years. We're also not going to send SpongeBob SquarePants. This guy doesn't intimidate me. Now, I do like the whole naval aspect of it is that he is in a submarine. But the thing is, is that if you're going to go to another country and you're going to make your presence known, you need to be seen. And the submarine 
seen is not seen. So Commodore Matthew Perry is going to be the guy we send. And we're going to send our Navy. Commodore Matthew Perry, he's going to go with, with, with naval ships. This is going to be a big force. This is going to look intimidating. And, of course, I did say Commodore Matthew Perry, not to be confused with the Matthew Perry of Friends. <clears throat> now, when we're looking at the United States and Japan, well, one's isolationist, one's expansionist. Well, I already told you we're looking to expand, right? So Jap Japan is actually an isolationist country. Uh, since the 1600s, they wanted to stay out of world affairs. They wanted to stay to themselves. They dealt with only a few countries, the Dutch being one of them, but they really were the type of country that liked to keep to themselves. We were an expansionist country, right? We wanted to extend our nation's boundaries. We wanted to become more powerful. Now, why are we going to want to open up trade with Japan? Well, as I kind of gave you a hint at earlier, we want to use it as a potential coaling base or a base where steamships could go to get more coal, restock their coal supply, maybe even take a rest. The United States Navy already used Hawaii as a port for coaling, but they needed another port for steamships in the east. So that's going to be some of the benefits that Japan's going to have if we're able to trade with them. Another thing. Um, as mentioned earlier, we said that there were a lot of uh, whaling ships and merchant ships from the United States that were in the Pacific. What we did have is that, unfortunately, at times you would have uh, ships that would become wrecked. Sailors would wind up on the shores of Japan. And once these sailors wound up on the shores of Japan, they were often not allowed to leave. They were also uh, you know, not treated fairly as a result of it. So this was something else that we wanted to clear up between ourselves and the Japanese. Another thing, you know, similar to what we looked at in the painting, where canals and trains were great for trade and commerce and boosting the economy, more trade is only going to benefit the United States of America. When we get into the encounter between Commodore and Matthew Perry and the Japanese, here we're just going to look at the next couple of slides, we're just going to look at some Japanese art. And, and these two paintings... Um, with a Japanese portrayal of what Commodore and Matthew Perry uh, looked like. And even though I showed you an original photo, slightly different from uh, what he actually looked like. Even the ships, um, since we did mention the Native Americans, if you, if you want to go back to Columbus encountering the Native Americans with three ships and what they may have thought of these huge ships as they were coming to the shore because they had never seen them before, you can kind of say that was very similar to what the Japanese were thinking and seeing when it came to the United States naval ships showing up to their shores. And again, look at the size of the ship. You have these guns over here. And again, when you're looking at these types of ships, these aren't pleasure boats. They are big. They are menacing. There are guns on it. And, uh, you know, here, President Millard Fillmore, by sending Commodore Matthew Perry and the Navy, he, he was making a statement, all right? He, was, he wanted to send them to the, kind of negotiate and talk about opening up trade, but um, he wanted us to have a little bit of an advantage, even though we weren't on our home field advantage. And again, when we look at what this encounter looked like to the Japanese, even with all these ships along the shore, these U.S. ships coming close to the shore, you know, it almost looks like an invasion when you're looking at this artwork again. You know, these ships, <clears throat> probably, uh, you know, the Japanese probably in shock and awe when they saw these ships for the first time. And this is an actual picture of what these ships did actually look like. Um, Americans wanted Japan to open up its ports to trade. That was something that was clearly evident. And President Millard Fillmore is going to send Commodore Matthew Perry to Japan to ask to open up trade relations with the United States. And, and essentially what Commodore Matthew Perry was doing is that he was going there representing the president, but he also had a letter to deliver. Now, here's just an excerpt from the letter <clears throat> from President Millard Fillmore to the emperor. We know that ancient laws of your Imperial Majesty's government do not allow foreign trade, except with the Chinese and the Dutch. But as the state of the world changes as new governments are formed, it seems wise from time to time to make new laws. President Millard Fillmore also goes on to say that if your Imperial Majesty were so far to change the ancient laws as to allow a free trade between the two countries, it would be, be extremely beneficial to both. So even in that little line, that excerpt I read to you there, I mean, he seems to be a little bit more persuasive, where he's saying, hey, there's a potential here if you open up trade with us. Both of us can pot potentially benefit from, from this particular exchange. Now, he winds up leaving, um, but he returns in 1854. 
And then when he returns in 1854, Commodore Matthew Perry uh, is able to get the Japanese to sign the Treaty of Kanagawa. Now, what's interesting is how he winds up getting them to sign this treaty. Um, many felt that he was using gunboat diplomacy. Again, we saw what these ships must have looked like to the Japanese. Gunboat diplomacy is using military forces to frighten foreigners into signing agreements. And one can say that that was possible in this instance. Here was just a letter from Commodore Matthew Perry to the Emperor. When one considers such an occasion, however, one will realize the victory will naturally be ours, and you shall by no means overcome us. Um, so again, when people often look at this, and each year when I talk about this, uh, students often look at this and go, well, you know, they're being a bully. You know, you're standing over a kid at the lunch table and you're saying, hey, give me your uh, lunch money, and you're rolling up your sleeves, and you're looking like you're going to fight, but you're not going to fight. And what does the weaker kid do? He gives, he gives in to save himself from getting beaten up. Now, since this does look like bullying, you know, one often asks, you know, as a country, how could we do this, All right? Other countries were also doing this. So the United States felt that, you know, we really didn't want to be left out um, as other countries are gaining other areas and other power and, and the ability to trade in other areas. Um, we needed rest stops so that we can provide coal. We needed more access to these things. Um, another thing to consider, this was going to help strengthen the United States and the military. And really, uh, even as a teacher of history and, and one has looked at a lot of documents, the simple answer is, unfortunately, is that because we could at that particular time. Um, in this Treaty of Kanagawa, here were a couple of things that we were going to work out. All right, J Japan had to help accept. Japan had to help, and they had to accept to help shipwreck sailors. That was one of the terms that was worked out. It's going to open up two ports to American trade. When we look at the dates, our initial contact with Japan was 1853. We returned in 1854. Um, opening up the ports of trade really doesn't take place until 1858. And as a result of this big takeaway from here is that Japan's going to become an industrial nation as a result of this.